All right, I'm going to start a series of videos answering letters that we've been receiving. I got a pretty good pile of them here. I'm going to answer this one first. Uh, this has been sent to me twice by a brother over in the UK, and I am very sorry that I didn't get around to this. Um, uh, quite busy, but uh, I'm going to read this thing that he sent here, letter, and I'll try to show the pictures and things with it. Um, he says, Dear Brian, thank you for your response to my recent letter on the church symbols, Hislops, Two Babylons, and Bible chapter and verse divisions. I wanted to just follow up with some more detailed info on the rooster symbol and hope you will find this interesting and especially pertinent as Easter approaches. And this has been a while that I ago. It was actually my father who first noticed the rooster weather vane on our local Church of England church, which is called St. Mary's, after watching your video on church building architecture and then asked what I thought the symbolism might be. A quick internet search came up with the following. Quote, Pope Nicholas I ordered that every church in Europe should have a rooster on its steeple as a reminder of Jesus' prophecy that the cock would not crow in the morning until Peter denounced him three times. Since in most churches the steeples had already a weather or wind vane, the highest point to place the rooster was at the top of the weather vane. End quote. As I mentioned, though, in my previous letter, the rooster as a pagan symbol goes way back and has some interesting implications. Below are some excerpts from an article titled The Symbology of the Rooster by Maria Manuela uh, de Oliveira, Martin's director of Museo do Oriente in Lisbon, Portugal. Probably butchered the Spanish there. Sorry about that. <laughs> Quote, several symbologies, symbologies are given to the rooster in the Western and Eastern cultures. In all of them, it is universally connected to the cult of the sun because it chants, chant, its chant announces sunrise, the rooster there, in other words. And he has Ezekiel 8, verse 15 through 18. In other Eastern cultures like India, the rooster is also the Hindu skanda that per personifies the energy of the sun. In Japan, the rooster is also important. It chants being associated with the gods, especially Ama Teresu, goddess of the sun, who leaves her cave attracted by the rays of the sun. In the West, the rooster is associated to the sacred. In Hellenic tradition, for instance, the rooster is associated to the gods and goddesses of the sun, Zeus, Apollo, Leto, and Artemis. And of course, this is all true. You know, it doesn't mean that roosters are satanic. Obviously, they're a creature that God created. No more than goats. You know, goats are involved in uh, you know black magic. Satanists will have a lot to do with goats and things. Um, that doesn't mean goats are satanic. God created them. It's just that people, when they start to worship the creature more than the creator, they'll start to make interesting, weird things out of the creatures. They'll start to worship them and make them symbolic of things and whatever else. Another quote here. Um, and here are some excerpts from an article, from another article titled Rooster, A Symbol of the Dawn and Vigilance. Uh, quote, As a rule, he, the rooster, is considered a symbol of the sun and the heavenly fire. The roots... Of this go back into mythology like the sun counts down he counts down the time heralding the coming of the new world of the day with his crowing this crowing has always been a reference of time for people i.e a living clock that gives a natural awakening signal villagers waited for the sign before starting their journey on the road after the second singing of the rooster village women usually got up from their beds to knead uh, bread and milk the cows <clears throat> When the rooster crowed for the third time, the entire working population of the village was already on its way to their work, daily work. In most cultures, the rooster is considered to be zoomorphic um, transformation of the deity sun and dawn. Therefore, most of the, these deities were depicted with a rooster head. In many religions, gods were accompanied by a rooster. According to folk legends and beliefs, night ghosts, uh, spirits, and devils disappear with the first cry of the cock. The rooster motif... Uh, dispersing evil spirits with his call and is the combination of many folk tales. It was often depicted on a cross along with the sun as a protection from the underworld. In Scandinavian myths, the cock with his golden comb guarded the rainbow bridge leading from the human world to the abode of the gods. In ancient Greece, the cock faithfully served many gods, Apollo, Athena, Hermes, Asclepius. A uh, rooster figurine adorns the spire of the cathedral of St. Vitus in Prague, it was exactly at this spot that during pagan times stood the idol of Sviatovit, which the Czech tribes saw as their chief god. They offered wine, loaves, and especially a black cock to the idol. Prague was seen as the original capital of warlocks and magicians. For alchemists, the cock has always been a symbol of the sun. Often 
features of a dragon are ascribed to the rooster. The black cock is closely linked to witchcraft, fortune-telling, and evil forces. For example, the Western Slavs know a monster named Vasilisk, Basilisk, uh, not in parentheses there, which has the head of a rooster, eyes of a toad, wings of a bat, and the body of a dragon. It was believed that such a monster was born out of a black cock of more than seven years old. The image of the black rooster is connected with water and the underground kingdom in the folklore and traditions of many peoples. In many cultures, the rooster is not only a sacred bird for the deities of sun and water, but also of fertility. The ritual of sacrificing a cock for the sake of getting a good harvest has been widely practiced since ancient times. Um, <clears throat> just show this real quick here. Try not to knock my microphone off the thing over there. This is the. These are the pictures of the St. Mary's Church there in his area. You can see the rooster there on top of the pagan building. And here's the basilisk right there. So, <clears throat> in other words, you know, again, there's no scripture for church buildings, and there's certainly no scripture uh, saying that you should commemorate the, uh, the cock or whatever else that the crowed three times. As I read these articles, the idioms of sun, dawn, and fertility rang loudly of Nimrod, Semiramis, and Tammuz. Yeah, exactly. The fact also that these idioms seem to be widespread, if not universal, in the mythologies of the world also, I think, suggests of their common origin in Babylon and the mystery religions. Yeah. That's, that's the thing. I mean, my, my issue with this whole uh, legitimacy of the two Babylons and Alexander Hislop's work and a lot of that stuff there. Um, you can do your research in other areas and it will corroborate what the two Babylons is about. So, but anyways, let me continue here with the letter. As I mentioned in my previous letter, when I thought about the rooster, the other thing that came to mind was also a cockatrice. In mythology, a cockatrice and a basilisk are similar creatures with a few differences. Both are a type of dragon-serpent-rooster hybrid. Both are said to be able to kill with a petrifying stare. One is said to be hatched by a serpent from a cock chicken's egg, and the other by a chicken from a serpent's egg. <clears throat> this immediately brought to mind Isaiah chapter 14, verse 29, which says, Rejoice not, not thou, whole Palestina, because the rod of him that smote thee is broken. For out of the serpent's root shall come forth a cockatrice, and his fruit shall be a fiery flying serpent. Very interesting. There's a lot of stuff in the Bible that people just go, well, that's just a, that's actually the ancient, you know, way of, they were ignorant back then, they were ancient, and they, uh, back in these ancient times, and, and that's their way of saying an, an airplane that they saw in the 20th century or something, <laughs> you know, or it could actually be what it says, and just, we haven't seen it today, but it's there, but um, anyways, it says, this I understand to be prophetically speaking of the coming Antichrist. It seems very interesting that the coming world leader would be given this appellation, uh, which has, of course, been obscured in modern translation by the word viper or adder. With all this in mind, the cockatrice combined with the solar symbolism, <clears throat> as the worship of the sun and the worship of the Antichrist have gone hand in hand since Babel, and the new dawn, new age aspect all tied together in one, I can't help but think that the rooster symbol on the top of the church Spires is really representing the coming Antichrist. What are your thoughts? Amen. Absolutely. There's, you know, I, I, I do believe that the New Age thing, I, again, I've come out and said the New Age movement's not behind the coming Antichrist. What I mean to say is, with that, that's a lot of the New Age stuff where they just eliminate anything to do with the Catholic Church and Babylonian mystery religion that Catholicism is. Um, no, I'm, I don't agree with that. But it is a Catholic sort of new agey thing that they're they're going to be merging a lot of this stuff together a lot of these pagan type beliefs and whatever else bringing it into that system of, of worshiping the antichrist and of course you know the whole world's going to worship the beast where do you worship at church buildings i've been saying that for years there's no scripture there's nothing in the bible saying to worship in a church building so why are there church buildings out there so that they can worship the Antichrist in them. But uh, continuing here with the letter, there is a different but equally astounding sub subject I also wanted to share with you about the church where we first noticed the weather vane as it has a surprising legacy in the history of the Bible and the church. I live in a small rural town called 
Hydlay, Hydlay, in Suffolk, Suffolk on the east coast of England. Butchering names again, I'm sorry. This innocuous little town, however, has a powerful spiritual legacy, both in a positive and negative way. Just outside town, there's a memorial to Dr. Roland T uh, Taylor, rector of Hadley, Hadley uh, who was one of the first martyrs of Bloody Mar Mary's Purge. Um, the memorial stands in the place where he was burned at the stake and also remembers his curate who later suffered the same fate. <clears throat> yeah, Mary was a total devil-possessed lunatic Catholic. There are Catholics that are nominal, and they're just, you know, Christ or Catholics, we say. They go to church on Christmas and Easter, um, and they're not real dangerous. But you get these, some of these Catholics are just nuts. But I'll show you these pictures here. There's the memorial. You can pause that and read it if you want to. And down there. Okay. And... Um, Continuing with the article here, or the uh, letter, excuse me. I had known of the monument since I was a child, but I had no idea until recently about the information I'm about to relate to you. A few months ago, I was in a conversation with a professor from the Trinitarian Bible Society. He told me that Dr. Taylor's last prayer was that God would raise up men from Hadley. Um, about 50 years later, five of the most gifted translators of, the, translators of the King James Version, including John Boys and John Overall, were from Hadley. <laughs> I, I should be saying that thing right. I don't know how to say it. Um, and the surrounding area. However, what follows next just shouts to me of spiritual warfare behind the scenes because two centuries later, the Oxford movement, which sought to Romanize the Church of England, was also birthed here. Hmm, very interesting. St. Mary's Church, Hadley, was built in the 13th century and reconstructed in the 15th century in its current form. It was an archbishop's particular and is almost a small cathedral. In the 1830s, a rector, the rector of Hadley, Hugh James Rose, began the British magazine which propagated high church teaching. In 1832, he hosted the Hadley Conference. The conference held in the Deanery Tower, the red building to the left of the church, um, led to agreement over the principles of the Oxford Movement. Oxford Movement, just real basic, uh, without getting into a whole lot of the stuff that went on there, led to the whole Westcott and Hort thing. It uh, led to the, the idea of higher, uh, the naturalistic textual criticism where the Bible is just like a book. It's, it's like any other book out there. There's nothing supernatural to it. It's, a, it's no translation can be inspired. That whole thing came from that whole Oxford movement, that whole line of thinking that we need the traditions of the church and whatever else. And, you know, we need ritual and ceremony and, and we should have the ordained clergy and that whole thing there where you just take this away from the common man. <clears throat> um, John Henry Newman was said to have been in attendance or at least visited Hadley during this time. Though based at Oxford University, the movement was formally con constituate, constituted, constituted here in Hadley, and was still active at St. Mary's until late in the 20th century. Sorry about that. Um, John Henry Newman, John Henry Newman, if I'm not mistaken, the name rings a bell. I'd, I'd have to look it up. I think he was connected with the Jesuits or a Jesuit himself. I forget what the whole deal was, but I remember the name. Um, I recently visited St. Mary's to ask about the movement. It seems they are quite proud of the heritage and are even planning a commemorative service to celebrate the movement later this year. I spoke to one of the parishioners who had written a book on the history of the church, as a, and as I was perusing the book, I made another startling discovery. The curate of St. Mary's from 1821 to 1833, when all of this was happening, was none other than Richard Chenevy Trench, later Archbishop of Dublin, to whom Gail Ripplinger has devoted a chapter in her book, Hazardous Material. Trench was also present at the meeting. I mean, beware of church councils. Whenever you have these educated, you know, church guys getting together, it's almost always a problem. As I'm sure you're aware, Trench was also a member of Westcott and Hort's revision committee. Hmm. And was one of the earliest to push for a revision decades before the RV committee got the go-ahead. He was also one of, if not the chief corrupter of Bible lexicons with pagan Greek and Eastern meanings, according to Ripplinger. Okay, I'll show you the uh, pictures on this page. See? 
There's the red building he's talking about, and there's a more better picture of it. Looking beyond the physical, it would appear that this seemingly unimportant and innocuous little town in the English countryside has been the site of some real battles in the spiritual realm. This seems just like just the kind of inversion the devil would try to bring about, a place which had such a powerful and positive spiritual legacy in Dr. Taylor and those translators of the King James Version. Two centuries later would be instrumental, it appears, in birthing some of the devil's primary last day's counteroffensives, in undermining the Bible and in bringing the separated brethren back to Rome. And that's what the Oxford Movement's all about, really, when you get right down to it. It's part of the Jesuit counter-reformation. I fully believe that. I took some pictures inside St. Mary's, as it is rather telling. This is supposedly a quote-unquote Protestant Anglican church, yet it looks more Catholic and even Babylonian, as you'll see, than the local Catholic church up the road, which ironically is actually quite plain. Note the eagle lectern and the 14th century baptismal font, complete with winged angels roundabout. I've been here many times throughout my life and went to the local primary school affiliated with the church, so came here regularly. But when I took these pictures with my present understanding, some things really jumped out at me as the next page will show. Again, I'll show you the pictures here. There you go, you get the eagle up there. There's the baptismal font. Infant baptism, nowhere in scripture. Definitely got the uh, sort of the Gothic, you know, architecture stuff going on there. <clears throat> Here is an enclosed area in the main hall, and on the table is a Madonna and Child painting, and of course, an ecumenical anglicized edition of the New Revised Standard Version in Pride of Place. A side chapel off the main hall is the most disturbing. On the table there is another Semiramis and Tammuz painting. Mary and baby Jesus, yeah. But to the right of the table there is something rather more disconcerting. Notice the glow. This, there is a sculpture which is referred to in the book, uh, a quote, a statue of Our Lady, and to me it just shouts Babylon, Ishtar, Isis, etc. This face, faceless female figure is standing on an obelisk, nursing an infant in her arms, whilst being lit from the back as by the rays of the morning sun, giving her a corona or halo. Could it get more Babylonian? Yeah, really. Again, I'll show you the pictures. There's your New Revised Standard Version right there. There's the picture of it. Think of Mary and the child there. As you can see. And there's the weird statue with the back lighting. Creepy. <laughs> I've been I've been around some of the stuff like that. You know, you go into these these pagan temples and whatever else or Catholic things, and you can just feel this kind of this cold, oppressive. Ooh, ooh, you just kind of get chills being in there. I can imagine you know getting chills in this place. Lastly, here's an excerpt from the book I was shown that covers the Oxford movement, and you get a check this out um, so um, says here Hugh James Rose got a thing on it. I'll show this in just a minute um, Rose was a high churchman who to propagate his views in 1832 founded the British magazine and so came into touch with the leaders of the Oxford movement out of the conference at his rectory in Hadley came the association uh, of Friends of the Church, founded by Hurl Frond and William Palmer. Down here it says the Hadley Conference and the Oxford Movement. I'll take my glasses off so I can read better. On the 25th through 29th of July, 1833, at Hadley and Suffolk, where Hugh James Rose was rector, a conference at which Richard Hurl Frode, John Kebble and Edward Pusey, John Henry Newman, there's the name again, Reverend Honorable Arthur Percival, and curate, later Archbishop of Dublin, Richard Chenevy Trench, are thought to have been present, was held in the deanery tower, which led to agreement over the principles of the Oxford movement. Now listen to this. Listen to this, what they, what they are saying was in the Oxford movement. 
to proclaim the doctrine of the apostolic succession. Did we hear that? There's a lot of Baptists that hold to that whole thing, that they're in the line of the apostles. Look out for that. The belief that it was sinful to give the laity a say in church affairs. Hmm. The need to make the church more popular and to protest against any attempts to disestablish the Anglican church. The need to make the church more popular. Started with the Oxford movement in the 19th century. Hmm. Kind regards, Matthew from the UK. So thank you, Matthew, for your letter. And I am deeply apologize that it took me so long to get to it. Again, here it is. Zoom in on that. So you can make that out. Down here is the other part. I'll try to zoom in on that as best as I can. And there you go. Um, people call me a fanatic and call me a nut and a cult leader and all this other stuff because I warn about church buildings. But I'll tell you what, I've seen so much proof that these church buildings are just of the devil. I mean, you just, you can't, you can't, you know, you can't do something that's wrong and wicked and just say, oh, I'm going to make this a Christian thing or whatever, this whole church building thing. And you're going in there and trying to worship the Lord with this stuff. Stay away from church buildings. That's my advice. So thank you very much, Matthew. I'm sorry that it took so long for me to get to it, but I really do appreciate the letter. And um, next video, I'm going to be answering some more. Thank you for watching.